For God so loved. Woo, that is loud. He does love a bit loudly. Good morning, Advanced Church. So glad to see all your lovely faces here. It just, I, I said to Derek last week, I said, you know, I've got to, I was being kidding. I've got to stop worshiping so hard when I'm speaking because by the time I come up here, my tears are streaming down my face and my voice is tired. But it just blesses my socks off to see these young men lead us like they do. Yeah, let's just appreciate them for a second. Thank you so much for your hearts for the Lord and your humility to do so. We are in a series called Mixtape. Now, I asked last week, but I am curious again, how many of you made a mixtape for someone else? Yep, yep, we've got some, yeah, yeah, I remember those days. Now, if you're too young to remember or too old to know, a mixtape was a cassette. Look it up, Google it, it exists. It was a cassette tape that you would make of your favorite songs, usually for your girlfriend or your boyfriend, so that they could know how much you cared about them. And they would listen to the love songs over and over and over again. And every time they heard them, they would think of you right? So you can see how this mixtape message is, is from God's heart to yours. What are the things that he says over and over and over and over again because he wants us to know how much he cares and what his feelings are towards us? Make sense? Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. Last week we talked about song one, that we are the beloved of God. We talked about John 15, verse 9, which says, I have loved you. This is Jesus talking to us. I have loved you just as the Father loves me. And we dove into the meaning of that and the being able to receive that and some of the things that stand in the way. If you, if you weren't here, I would encourage you to listen to it. It will bless you. John 3, 16 to 17, familiar, familiar verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his beloved son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But right after, John 3, 16, verse 17 says this, For God did not send his son to condemn the world. What does condemn mean? To doom. To to. Basically say there's no hope and there's no future. If I was to condemn a building, I would say there is no use for this. Tear it down. It is condemned. Right? Yes? Following? Yeah. I need lots of interaction this morning just because I did not sleep. So <laughs> I mean, keep me on track by going, yes, Chandra. No, Chandra. Yes, Chandra. Okay. <laughs> okay. He did not send his son to condemn the world, saying, you're useless, there is nothing left of you, be gone, but to save the world. We forget that we're the beloved, don't we? And we forget, even as Christian people, we forget we're saved. Yes, Chandra, that's what you're, yes, Chandra. <laughs> we tend to act as though we still stand condemned. That even though we're recipients of the love and grace of God, that we're believers in what he did on the cross, there's a tendency for us to forget and act like none of that ever happened. That we go before God and we're like, I am the worst person ever and you're hating me and you should just send me somewhere bad. Not And fully, fully setting aside everything that God came to do. That's why I actually think these are paired together. Like the most famous verse of history, I think Jesus kind of knew it would be a hit. And so he placed it right after your tendency, right? You loved me so that I could have eternal life. And then he clarifies, just in case we missed it, for God did not. That means he didn't, right? Did not. Yes, Chandra. See, you've got it now. Yes, Chandra. I understand, Chandra. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. Let's remember that. What a great salvation we have. What a great salvation we have. And yet, we tend to forget it. 
because we're forgetful people. <laughs> so let's turn to Zechariah 3 and look again at what great a salvation we have. Okay, turn to Zechariah 3 in your phones, or you can look right here too if you want. If you're too lazy, it's okay. Zechariah, just to give some context, was a prophet and a priest. And he wrote the book, Zechariah. Remember that. You might need to write that down. Zechariah wrote, okay. I told you I didn't sleep, guys, so my humor is off. <laughs> in his book, he writes about eight visions that he had in the middle of the night, over a series of night, that he had concerning God's people. And Zechariah 3 is one of those visions and that we're going to look at this morning. So Zechariah 3, verse 1, he says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And just before we go any further, I'm going to put some context. Joshua, don't get confused, because I did, to be honest. I was like, Joshua, being written about in Zechariah, like that would mean he's like a thousand and one years old, because I thought maybe he was the Joshua with Moses. He's not. Okay. I had to look that up. <laughs> Is not Joshua was the name of the high priest at the time. The high priest was the person who was the top of the top in the religious order who represented the people before God and represented God's word to the people. Okay, so this is who we're talking about, Joshua the high priest. Standing before the angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord is symbolic of Jesus, okay? We're all following? Yes, Chandra. Yes, Chandra. Yes. <laughs> okay. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Okay, so I'm going to set this scene like a movie, okay? So you've got the angel of the Lord standing here, Jesus. And before him, so standing here, is Joshua the high priest, which represents the people. So I'm just going to put it in there right now. It's, it's representative of us, okay? The people of God. And at Joshua's right hand, so right here, is Satan. To accuse who? Joshua. Before who? God. Okay, got the scene? Like a little court case going on? Okay. This is the vision. And the Lord said to Satan. Okay, so I'm the Lord now. The Lord said to Satan, not you, invisible person here, not Derek. Okay. <laughs> the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, representative of the people again, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a man, a burning stick, snatched from the fire? Okay, so there's, there's a lot of confusing symbolism in there, but let me just again paint the picture. You're dragged to court by someone who has a case against you, right? So you're dragged to court, you have to go. So you show up, and your prosecutor, who holds the case against you, presents their case, accusing you of all your wrongdoing before the judge, in which case it would be the angel of the Lord, Jesus. Okay? So I'm standing there in a court case, waiting to be adjudged. And I don't know about you, but if I really put myself in that situation, I don't have the most confidence in the world because I know I've done things wrong. I know I have things I can be accused of. So I'm a little bit nervous how this is going to go because the perfect one is standing in front of me and my enemy is pointing fingers at me and I can't totally deny everything that he's saying. And this is what Jesus does first. The Lord said to Satan, our accuser, the Lord rebuke you. Okay, immediately I'm starting to feel a little better. Right? Even, like, no sentence passed. Like, okay, my eyes turn up like, oh, well, that's good. <laughs> rebuke you. Rebuke means to, ex to express sharp disapproval for a fault. So instead of me being rebuked, first and foremost, for like, what have you done? You're not good enough, da 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 Jesus first addressed the enemy, Satan, the accuser, and says, the Lord rebuke you. And if that wasn't good enough, he reiterated, reiterates whose side he's on. The Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem. That's a nice little description there to have in your back pocket, isn't it? 
the Lord who has chosen his people. So I'm standing here basically saying, the Lord, or he's basically saying over my life, <laughs> if I'm standing here, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Chandra rebuke you. Okay, I'm feeling a lot better. Like now I'm listening to how the, okay, let's do this thing. <laughs> I got friends in high places. Like, like, right? Like I go in and I go in with fear and trembling, knowing, knowing I'm not worthy, knowing that I can't fight this accusation, that I can't deny the things that he's saying, knowing that it does cost stuff. And so I come before in trembling, and the first thing that Jesus does is rebuke the enemy and reiterate to the enemy, I've chosen this one. Is this not a man or a woman, a burning snick, stick snatched from the fire? Is this not someone I've saved? Is what this is basically saying. I've snatched him from death and brought him out of life, or brought him to life. Is this not one I have saved? <sighs> I forgot for a minute. I forgot for a minute. My own salvation is in Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verse 12. God calls us his chosen people, holy and dearly loved. In Deuteronomy 14, 2, the Lord has chosen you to be his people, his cherished possessions. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's treasure. Is this not one I have saved? This is my girl. This is my girl. This is my guy that you dragged to court in front of me. How many people are feeling a little better? <laughs> yes, Chandra. <laughs> no, just you. I'm just using. <laughs> okay, verse 3. Okay, this is my... I was going to say my favorite part, but it's not, because they're all my favorite part. But this is a really awesome part. Verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. Okay, get the scene with me. See the movie. I don't come to him with merit, with defense with money, with status, with I am the highest of the high. Now think of who this was. This was Joshua, the high priest. Basically the highest you could get religiously. And he was standing in filthy clothes, representative of his unworthiness. His sin was on his life. And he was standing there before the Lord. Again, let's rewind the movie. <laughs> We have this bit of information now that Satan drags us to court in our filthy clothes. And Jesus says to Satan, while we're standing there in our filthy clothes, and he says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, the one who I have chosen. This is the one I've chosen. This is the one I've saved. The Lord rebuke you. Now, how many of you are feeling a little better? <laughs> yeah. I am standing unworthy of the Lord, and he defends me. <sighs> Did Jesus chose us while we were covered in our own filth, our own unworthiness, and our own sin? Yes. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. While we were still powerless to defend ourselves, we don't have a lawyer. We didn't have a lawyer. We didn't have a defense. We had nothing to stand up to the accusations. We were defenseless. Christ died for the ungodly. While we were defenseless, Christ died for the ungodly. Huh. Satan had a lot to accuse Joshua of. It's not always that Satan accuses us of things that we haven't done. He is the father of all lies, but sometimes he tells the truth about what we've done and then lies to us about what it means. Right? He takes a little bit of truth and then twists it all out of proportion. 
and then points to the little tiny bit of truth as evidence to everything else that he just said. You're guilty, aren't you, Chandra? You did that. So God's going to be super mad with you. He's going to kick you out of court. He's going to send you to hell. You should just leave. And that just broke. <laughs> Thank you. He uses evidence against us, building up his case like a well-trained lawyer. This means that, and that means this, and this means that, and I present to you my evidence. She is guilty. And the only thing I can say is, yes, I am. What do you plead? Um, guilty. Yeah. And the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. This is my chosen one. One of the ones I've saved. The greatest act of love that could possibly performed, be performed for another person was done when I was at my worst, my darkest, my filthiest, when I had nothing in return. The Hebrew word translated for filth here is the strongest expression of, in the Hebrew language for filth and vile and disgust. Code word covered in excrement, a.k.a. poop. <laughs> this is when God decided to intervene in my life, rebuke the enemy, and set me free. When I was at my worst. Verse 4. The angel said to those who were standing before him, remove his filthy clothes from him. Then he said to Joshua, so now, that, now this is Jesus, the angel of the Lord, speaking to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich clothes on you. Okay, again, another one of my favorite parts. Okay, I love this movie. I just woke Carl up. Ha <laughs> ha. It's another one of my favorite parts. So if you set the scene again, we're going through the movie again. Jesus, the angel of the Lord, standing here. This is us before him. Satan at the right hand to accuse him. Joshua is in filthy clothes, and the witness is around. Jesus says to the witnesses around, "Take strip him of that. To get that off of him. And then he, the angel of the Lord, says to Joshua, us. The, now this, in the movie, remember, this is the very first thing that is spoken directly to Joshua. Everything else has been to uh, either the enemy or other things. And this is the first thing that he says to Joshua directly. He says to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin. I love this word, see. It means be sure to see. Behold. Don't miss this observable, objective fact. See as to learn to, lo to know, to receive, to perceive what's going on. See what I've already done. It's, it's an interjection, an interruption into the sentence here, okay? So he's standing there, and no matter what his thoughts of are, because we don't know what Joshua's thoughts are of everything going on around him, but no matter what his own thoughts were of himself or anything going around him, Jesus kind of interrupts because he's dealing with their everything, and he interjects and he interrupts with, See! Behold! It's like if I was just, I'm going to pick on you, Carl, but I love you. Carl was in his own thoughts. And when I said see, he actually physically jumped. Okay? It's kind of like that. I love you, Carl. Did I embarrass you finally? Ah! Oh, I have this, I'm trying to embarrass him because he doesn't embarrass. And we have a thing. <laughs> we have a thing that I just, my goal in life is to embarrass Carl. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so he kind of jumped out of his own thoughts. And don't you think that's kind of what we do? Is we're kind of assessing the situation, assessing the threat. What is God going to think? What is the enemy going to think? What are other people going to think? What am I doing? Should I run from here? I don't like this situation. And then Jesus kind of interrupts with, see, behold, snaps us out of our own thoughts and says, look, 
with your eyeballs at what I have already done. Oh, how'd that happen? <laughs> when did, what did, what's, you've taken away, you've removed my filth. What, what, how? <laughs> Behold, in a movie, if you go to like old school biblical movies, you know the voice that they use for God, okay, in old school movies, it's like, behold. That, that was terrible. Derek, do it. Behold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, whoa, what was that? Do you know what I mean? It interrupts us out of our thoughts with this booming, powerful um, voice that snaps us out of our realization that the enemy is not very big. And the one that I'm standing in front of, who's doing this all in front of me, is powerful and mighty. And he's the one directing my gaze to what he has already done. Already. He constantly draws our attention back to the cross of Jesus Christ. Look, perceive, open your eyeballs. My, do <laughs> my daughter, when she was about three or four, she would come in the, my room in the morning, and instead of like waking me up like a normal child, she would literally just open my eyelid like this. She'd go, ah, and open my open my eyelid. And somehow I feel like Jesus can do that sometimes, of just like taking his fingers and going, Dunk. look, I need you to wake up. I need you to see what's going on. See what I've done. Verse 5, then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on, his turban on his head and clothed him. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Okay, another favorite part. Remember Joshua was a high priest, representative of the people. The turban was part of the high priest's garments. And we can read in Exodus 28 that on the front of the turban was a gold plate that was inscribed. Okay? Don't miss what I'm don't miss what I'm saying. Okay? A gold plate that was inscribed with these words, holy to the Lord. Let's just sink in your spirit here. Not only does Jesus strip away our sin, strip away our unworthiness, pay for it, fully pay for it, send it away, remove it as far as the east is from the west, but he gives us himself, his own righteousness, his own holiness, and places it on our shoulders. And so when I entered in, I'm covered in poo and wondering how this is going to go. And at the end of this story, I am clean and clothed and, remo and reminded of my acceptance and my chosenness and my belovedness with a clean turban on my head with an inscription that says, Holy to the Lord. All because of the grace and gift of God. This is our salvation. This is what we forget. We say, oh, I'm so glad I'm saved, and yet live like none of this ever happened. It goes way over our head. And this morning, I'm sent to you to say, this is the salvation. This is what God has done. He died for us. He removed those things, and he placed on your shoulders the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And he inscribed on your forehead, holy to the Lord. Do you know what holy means? Set apart perfect, set apart and perfect and pure and clean. I mean, I want that turban. Can, can you really imagine walking around like we do with the inscription on our forehead, holy to the Lord, and walking in his presence and running up to him and giving him a hug, knowing we're fully accepted and we're fully loved and he loves us and accepts us and delights in us and we're holy to him. This is our salvation. I do not want any one of you to continue living as though you stand condemned. 
when you aren't, when he has already died. And because of your belief in the person of Jesus Christ, this is your salvation. Holy to the Lord. Ephesians 1, verses 4 to 5. Even before he made the world, God loved us. He chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. I want, this is two scriptures, two scriptures. And I want you to, I want you to write the, oh my gosh, reference, thank you. I want you to write the reference down. Because in here, there's so many things clothed and given to you. And things to remind you of who you are and who God is and what he's done. In two verses. For even before he made the world, which means he created us to. First thing, he loved us. First, loved one of the identity pieces we can wear as clothing, loved, and chose us. I'm not only loved, I'm chosen. I'm loved, I'm chosen in Jesus to be what? Holy. I'm loved, I'm chosen, I'm holy to the Lord. So when the enemy stands here and says, Nobody loves you. you you're going to be rejected by God because nobody loves you because of all your sin. I can pull up this verse and go, Ahem. I am loved. I would like to submit my own evidence to this court, and I will put God's word on the table and say, I am loved. I am chosen in Jesus Christ. I am holy and blameless in his sight because he said so. I'll submit that to the court. God decided in advance to adopt us, to make us his own children. Okay, picture this scene in this court case. This is looking like the enemy's, he's losing pretty bad, okay? He's losing really bad. Because now <laughs> I'm standing there, and we do have something to refute him, not in and of ourselves. But our advocate, Jesus Christ, gave us these words, gave us this identity, placed them on our shoulders. So now Je when the enemy is accusing us, he's coming against the one that Jesus, the judge, has declared loved, chosen, holy, my child. Now, I do have a little bit of a mama bear side to me that you can insult me and I will get mad. But I won't take it out on you. I'll just take it out later on my pillow and cry. But if you insult one of my kids, mama bear comes out of like, nah, -uh, that's my kid. I can yell at them. You cannot. Right? <laughs> I can say you need to hurry up, but you cannot. <laughs> I can say all these kinds of things, but you insulting my kid brings out mama bear because that is not true. So don't say that about my kid. So now the enemy is going to be in some serious trouble because who is he accusing? The very children of God. I'm adopted. I'm part of his family by bringing himself to us through Jesus Christ. So I'm loved. I'm chosen. I'm holy. I'm blameless. I'm adopted. I'm a son or daughter of Christ. And I am near to God. Now, isn't that one of the things that the enemy just loves to accuse? You're so far from God. You're so far from God. If anybody found out, they would just throw you out because you're so far from God. Lies. Lies. Those are your feelings. Feelings lie. Scripture doesn't. He brought us near to himself. We are close to the heart of God. 
No matter what we feel, we are close to the heart of God. No matter what we have done, we are close to the heart of God because of Jesus. We are loved. We are chosen. We are holy. We are blameless. We are adopted. We are close to the heart of God. The devil, is, his case is looking sad, isn't it? It's looking very, very sad, praise God. This is what God wanted to do, and it would give him great pleasure. Now, do you know that you are delighted in? Delighted in. It's one thing to really embrace that we're loved, and another to think that we're delighted in. That I'm not bothering God. I'm not a pain to him. He doesn't wish I would just go away. But that he rejoices, and he actually, Scripture says, he sings over us. I think that's kind of embarrassing, honestly. If somebody, Derek, wanted to sing to me, which he did in our proposal, but he knew I was very shy, so we went to somewhere like no one was. No one else was. And I... <laughs> I'm so thankful for you. I was so, like, shy. I was, like, he's singing to me these, l this love song, and I'm, like, hmm. And I'm watching, like, if anybody's coming, because I'm, like, as soon as anybody's coming, you have to stop. And I had, like, one eye, like, don't embarrass me. <laughs> but can you imagine you're waking up, you're not having a great day, and can you imagine just having the heavens split and you actually seeing God sing and delight and rejoice over you. We're, cho we're loved, we're chosen, we're holy, we're blameless, adopted, close, and delighted in. This is our salvation. So this is my favorite part right now. Romans 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, now, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. None. Verse 33 of the same chapter. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. Now, I want you to get this, because it's so good. It's such a good movie, so play it in your head. Okay, the beginning of the movie starts with Joshua coming into court, being dragged by the enemy, dragged before the Lord, covered in poop before the angel of the Lord, not sure what to expect, not sure what's going to happen. And as the movie plays out, Jesus rebukes the enemy and reminds us of what he has already done. He strips us of our unworthiness and places the worthiness of God on top of us through Jesus. Christ through faith in what he did. That's it. Through faith in what he did. The faith, the type of faith that acts you to, leads you to actually walk in those things. Not just oh yeah, that happened. But like that happened to the place where I will actually walk in those things. That's what's going on. So then he strips us, strips the whole case against us because of his death and resurrection. He strips everything, every ounce of fuel that the enemy had in his back pocket of like, this is the case and it's ironclad and he, this is how it's going to go. And he strips all of that from the enemy by his death and resurrection. And then we come to the New Testament and says, who will bring any charge? Picture this, okay? This is the end of the movie here. Against the one whom God has chosen, his people who have faith in him. Because it's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Okay, so think of it as a court case. And you know you go to your local court. If I'm mistaken in this, social studies was not my strong suit. Okay? <laughs> you go to court. You have a judge. For whatever reason, you don't like that judge. Or your court case doesn't go the right way. And Satan appeals to a greater judge. You go up a level, right? Right? which in this case is not up a level because it's the same person. <laughs> but it's like Jesus has done everything, and it's like who is, there to who is there to condemn? Like 
Satan, what do you have now? Where are you going to go now? Who are you going to appeal to now? Because if you go above Jesus' head, which, again, he's, he's God, okay? He's not above Jesus' head. He is God. They are one and the same, but they are three and one. For it's God who justifies. So if you appeal and go to the next judge, it's God who's declared that Jesus' sacrifice was enough. He was the one who justifies us. Like, yes, I am satisfied. The law has been kept. The sin has been paid for. And this one is ours. Who is left then to condemn? Because the one sitting in the place who could condemn you, Jesus is judge, and he could say, no, this is not worth it, da-da-da-da-da-da. Listen to this. Picture this. The one who has the only authority left to condemn you is the one who died and rose again and was raised to life. And where is he seated? He's at the right hand of God. And what is he doing? He's interceding for us. <laughs> Do you get it? Do you, did you absorb that? The one who sits in the position who possibly has the authority to condemn you has paid the price and made it all possible that through Jesus Christ, through him, he's standing to the judge of all judges and saying, I paid for that one. I'm interceding. Never mind what the enemy says. It's all paid for. I, I'm, I'm advocating for this one. So <laughs> the movie is Satan comes in accusing this one before this one. Jesus pays for all of this, dismisses the case, and then even if Satan tries to appeal, Jesus is standing there and going, that one's mine. That one's mine. Don't touch them. That one's mine. I got her. I got her. Yeah, see God? I got her. My righteousness, it's on her. I got her. I got her. I got her. She's not going to fall. She's not going to fall. She may stumble. She will not fall because I got her. She's mine. <laughs> We've got friends in high places who humbled himself to represent us and make us righteous before God. This is our salvation. Don't let anyone tell you that it's not. Don't let the enemy tell you that you still stand condemned. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in him, basically, if we're using this court example, if I'm here and I say, yes, I do want Jesus to be my lawyer, then he's your lawyer and his righteousness becomes yours. That's what faith is, is putting my trust, my fate, my hope, my life, I'm literally putting my life into his hands. He speaks for me. He speaks for me. I don't. Jesus' death and resurrection speaks for me. That's me putting my faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and because of that, there is no condemnation. None. Not even a little. When there is, therefore, now no condemnation, do you know what no condemnation means? No condemnation. None. None. I think I think I need I think I need to just dwell here for a second. None. The doom. Going back to the building, if I was to condemn a building, I would be sentencing it to its destruction because it's unworthy of carrying any weight on it. Make sense? So when Jesus comes and does not condemn us, no part of him is saying about any part of us, you are to be destroyed and taken away from me. None. My sin is paid for. And I have a lifetime of shedding that because it just holds me back from understanding what God has done. Sin holds me back from understanding what I have. 
And he says to put it off because those things have already been put off from you. In other words, don't let those things entangle you and get caught up into the wrong things. Shed them. They're not helping you at all. But you're not condemned. You are not condemned. You are saved. So I throw my unworthiness, I throw my inability to keep up. I throw all of my sin at the foot of the cross and say, God, take this from me and enable me through the power of your Holy Spirit to walk free of those things. This is our salvation. I want to set the scene again. I'm really not saying anything different than I said before, but I just don't want you to miss it. That Satan comes and drags us before the Lord, accusing us of all kinds of things that realistically we probably have done, at least some of them, but attaches all kinds of meanings to them that it doesn't mean. Therefore, you should go to hell. Therefore, God is disgusted with you. Therefore, you should not go to church. You should not talk about this to other people. You should run away. You should hide. You should be ashamed. You should dive further into sin. You should. He makes all kinds of conclusions about stuff, doesn't he? It's annoying. He just doesn't shut up. Even though he's lost the case, he just doesn't like admitting that he already lost. So what the power he has is to convince you that he hasn't lost yet. And just keep telling you, you're this, you're that, and it means this. And he just keeps talking. It's annoying. But Jesus says to him, and it already has rebuked all the case that he has against you. And has chosen you and redeemed you and clothed you with his righteousness and given you a new identity and a new hope and eternal life. And he is ever interceding at the one, the one who is more powerful than all. And these are the ones who have stooped down to your level, paid our price so that we can be with him for all of eternity. This is the message that churches are bringing. This is the message of salvation. Now, I think the churches kind of do a bad job. We do a bad job sometimes because we forget. And we focus about all kinds of other things and we misinterpret and then our own internal dialogue gets in the way and we hear things wrong and all that kind of stuff. But this is the salvation of God that Jesus died and rose again that you who believe would have eternal life and right standing with God to be delighted in and chosen and, and re enjoy him for all of eternity. And it's not like one day when I'm in heaven I will become worthy of God. No, the cross of Christ stands for all of eternity. So I have eternal life through the work of Jesus Christ because the cross ever stands in my favor. So I will be in heaven for the rest of my life because, what, because of what he did. Do you feel better? Are you reminded? We need to remember over and over and over again and let our minds dwell on the salvation and love and chosenness of God. Just like our minds kind of stew like this. You know why our minds do that? Because they were made to meditate. But they're fallen minds. So instead of meditating on the things of God, we get caught up in meditating the things of earth. The meditating of how unworthy we are. And we stew like this. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. When God renews our mind, we are to meditate and think over and over and over about the truth of God. I'm chosen. I'm loved. I'm forgiven. I'm saved. I'm justified. I have forever with him. He delights in me. He rejoices over me. He sings over me. Over and over and over and over. Meditate on the things of God. Let him renew your mind and take that same ability to stew about terrible things and let him stir you up to dwell on the truth of God over and over and over and over again. Like I just can't. I just can't get past the belovedness that I am in Christ. I just can't get past that he chose me. I just can't get past that I'm holy before him. I just can't get past that he's deemed me with his clothes so that the beauty of Christ is on me. 
that I am beautiful because of the beauty of Christ upon my life. Amen? Can, can we ask God to turn our minds that way? That we would stew in grace. That we would stew in the love of God. That we would stew in our salvation. Not all this other stuff. Okay, we're going to pray in a second, but just before I do. I <laughs> was writing this sermon, and my heart was just overflowing. And I was like, there is so much truth in here, I can't possibly stop talking on Sunday. <laughs> so I was praying about, like, what to cut, because there's so many good truths and so many exciting things to, that was renewing my mind and enabling me to really look to God and look at my salvation and, and find the joy of my salvation again, that, that I felt to write this with the overflow of thoughts that I can't put in here, okay? So this is five truths that battle negative thoughts. And these are five truths that are, I either reiterated or I had to cut because of time that I believe God is just speaking over his church, giving us things to dwell on, the truth of who he is and the truth of what he's done. So this is the, available to you at the back uh, just for free. I only have a few copies of this because this is done in a devotional that we're going to do this week together. If you would like to receive that daily devotional, a five-day devotional, um, can you speak to Susan? Can you give us a little wave here? Susan or myself, or you can email smallgroups at advancedchurch.ca to be a part of that and receive that. Of course, if you prefer a physical copy, just there's some at the welcome desk. That's there to just allow the Lord to, to speak to you about this further in your personal devotions and what he may have to say to you directly. Okay, I'm going to pray, and then Derek's going to close the service. Lord Jesus. Righteous judge, Father of heaven, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for having the kindness, the humility, the joy, the delight to come and save someone like me, a wretch, desperately broken. Thank you for paying not just for most of my sin, but all of it. Would you enable me and every person here for their eyes to be revealed and their heart to be renewed, their mind to be renewed unto the truths of God, to see our salvation, to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord Jesus, only you and your spirit can do that, so we're giving you permission to do that in my life. And I pray they would give permission for you to do that in theirs. With every head bowed, every eye closed. This is not for me. This is between you and God. But if God's been speaking to you about salvation, that you want a part of this, could you just raise your hand? Yes, I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. You can put them down. And if it's your prayer today, that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes further, that you would see your own salvation. See how great a salvation it is. Would you raise your hands? With every hand raised, Lord, we ask as this is a prayer. This is our prayer, God. We give you permission. We ask for the Holy Spirit to do it. And we know it's your will. We know you desire to reveal it to us. And we know that we already have everything that we ask according to your will. So I am believing and I am rejoicing that it will be done and it has been done. In Jesus' name we all said, 
Amen.